I don't know about you, but I've had quite a week. I've had great opportunities uh, for gospel ministry and just some really wild, unexpected things happen. But I don't have time to talk about it. Oh, and by the way, I had my first grandson too, so pretty exciting. Received a note from uh, Pastor Mike the other day, and he told me that uh, there in South Africa they had 31 foot waves. I want to say, Mike, those aren't waves, that's a tsunami. <laughs> kind of thing that you don't recover from. Run! You know, but uh, he's doing well. Also sent me a little video of the guys, you know, he's sitting in the back of the church and he's getting ready to preach and the guys are singing and, and it was, uh, they were singing with verve. So I like that a lot. Well, when I talk to unbelievers, and I had the opportunity this week, I hope you did too, there's one thing that really motivates me and it's this question. And this is a question I think you should just kind of fix in your head, in your mind. How does your church, if they're churchgoers, how does your religion, or how do you plan on getting to heaven? Because you'll hear all kinds of answers. And there are answers from a variety of different religions too. The world's largest non-Christian religion, Islam has five pillars. Five. Five pillars. They are, you know, must make a profession of faith, which I can recount for you. I can say it, but then if I did, I'd be a Muslim, and I don't want to do that. You must do that. You must pray. You must fast. You must give alms to the poor. And you must complete, if you are able, a hajj or a pilgrimage to Mecca. Yet even that may not be enough. At the end of your life, you may stand before Allah, their God, and he may decide not to let you into paradise. Capricious, arbitrary, and yet there's a list of things to do. The world's largest Christian religion, I put Christian in quotations, is Roman Catholicism. How does Rome teach that you get to heaven? by a combination of good works. They have seven sacraments and grace, they would say, but they redefine grace. Grace is no longer something that God initiates to someone who can't do anything for themselves, but it is something that is channeled through the church to you by virtue of your actions. You work, and then God responds with grace. And our response is, that's not grace at all. That is not grace at all. But the truth is, every religion, except for biblical Christianity, has a series of things that you must do. A laundry list, as it were. You know, a checklist. You must do this, and this, and this, and this. Why is that? Because they're all trying to answer that one basic question. How do you get to heaven? And it's kind of built into us, and we'll see that this morning, that we want to do something. We want that list. Tell us what we have to do. That's all I want to know. Just, just tell me, you know, soup to nuts, A to Z, what do I have to do to get to heaven? That's our human nature. Let's open our Bibles to John chapter 6. And today we're going to see the chasm that exists, the the massive gap that exists between the religions of man and the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, just to kind of catch us up to where we are in the gospel of John, we've seen numerous testimonies to the deity of Christ in this book, starting really from the first verse. In the beginning was the Word. It has to do with His eternality. And his miraculous signs provoked even Nicodemus, the teacher of all Israel, to come to him and try to sort out exactly what sort of man was this sent from God. And the last time we were in John, we saw how he fed the multitudes, and then when he perceived that they wanted to seize him and make him king, he somehow, we're not told how, eluded them, and they didn't get it done. But... Then he commanded his disciples to get into a boat and set sail for the other side of the Sea of Galilee. 
And he prayed alone, we're told from Mark. And they began crossing. Sometime later, as they're on the sea, a storm erupted. Maybe with 31 foot high waves. Surf, as, as some people like to call it. <coughs> but the disciples started doing the intelligent thing. They panicked. Right? And in, at the height of their panic, as the wind is blowing and the waves are just raging, here comes this figure walking towards them. It goes from bad to worse, right? And they say what? Matthew tells us that they say, it's a ghost! It's not just bad enough that we're in the midst of this horrible storm. Here comes a ghost to make things worse. And it turns out, of course, it wasn't a ghost at all. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter boldly wants to get out, walk on the water, starts, falls, the Lord picks him up. Then a couple of amazing things happen. Peter and Jesus get into the boat, and what happens? Instantly, two things happen. The storm stops, and they're on the other side of the lake. Boom, like that, instantly. The whole thing, this uneventful journey, as it was supposed to be, is over. And here they are on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. So as we begin, really, what is the bread of life discourse, we get into a section that summarizes uh, the Gospel of John's purpose. We would read in John 20, verse 31, so that you may believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in His name. That's exactly what we're going to see this morning as we go to John chapter 6. And I'm going to read beginning in verse 22. John 6, verse 22. On the next day, that is to say the day after the feeding, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, verily, verily, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him, whom he has sent. Now this morning, I really have three points. Two of them, though, are universal truths. They're truths that are, they're true about every single one of us in here before we get saved. And then one saving truth. And I want you to just glory in the finished and saving work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every person here needs salvation. And there are two truths that are correct about us that are absolutely universally applicable before salvation and then we'll see the call of the Savior to believe on Him. Our first universal truth. I'll say it the harsh way first and then I'll say it more politically correctly. Man is naturally lazy. The more politically correct way is we have a desire to be saved from work. We don't want to work. Look at verse 22. We're going to develop this a little bit. Listen. Verse 22, on the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea, stop. So this is the day after the feeding of the 5,000, maybe 20,000, 5,000 men in a large multitude. The day after this crowd had desired to take and make him king. That's the day that we're on. And during the night, the disciples, as we read, crossed the sea, and Jesus had joined them somewhat unexpectedly. 
Now, we're not told what they did all night, what the crowd did all night, but it seems likely that they were looking for Jesus. They wanted to make him king. They lost him, and they were probably searching for him in some way or another. But if you look back at verse 15, we're told that he withdrew to pray, and that verb means to take refuge. And I bet he was. I mean, there's probably some noise and some tumult as they're looking for him. He wanted refuge. He wanted quiet. And that's one of the reasons why he commanded his disciples to go away. He wanted some time by himself. We certainly have the idea that uh, they, they probably spent the night looking for him, and then when darkness fell, they, they most likely stopped. So when morning breaks, they still haven't found him. And look at verse 22 again. They saw that there had been only one boat there, and Jesus had not entered the boat with the disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Okay, so let's sort of put this together. They knew that there was only one boat where they'd eaten. They saw the disciples get in the boat. They saw that Jesus was not with them. So if I'm leading the search, I would have felt pretty good about my chances of getting. Where's he going to go? I, we're going to find him. How far can he have gone? He must be somewhere in here. Morning comes, the, the only boat, the disciples are gone. Now what? Where did he go? How did he get there? How can we find him? So what do they do? What would you do? You know where the disciples are, so it makes some kind of sense to go and try to find the disciples. So, you know, I, I would put it this way. It's almost like they call the taxi service, right? Actually, the reality is it, it's not explained in our text, but one of two things happens. Either there are just some random boats coming up the coast from Tiberias, or word gets around that there are a bunch of people stuck on one side that want to go to the other side. Law of supply and demand, right? So these boats arrive. In fact, we see that in verse 23. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So they arrived at the location where this crowd is. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats. Anybody need a taxi? Yes. And they went to Capernaum, seeing Jesus. They're still looking for him. Now, why Capernaum? Well, it was really the central hub of Jesus' ministry when he was in Galilee. This is where he would go, and it seemed like a reasonable place to look. Plus, most likely they knew that that's where the disciples had gone. So it's logical to presume that at some point Jesus is going to catch up with them, or they're going to catch up with him, but this is as good a starting place as any. And finally, the efforts of the crowd were rewarded. They looked probably most of the night. Get up in the morning, can't find him, catch some boats, go across. So we're talking later on in the day, that following day. They find him and they ask a rather curious question. Look at verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Why do I say that's a curious question? Think about it for a minute. They, they know when, right? I mean, they have a window. It's not like so, like he was gone for weeks. Hey, when did you get here? This is a relatively short period of time. This is a small window of time. It's less than a day. And it wasn't that hard to find him. You know, this wasn't, going to Capernaum wasn't quite like going to L.A. And I say L.A. because it's all sprawled out. It's not like Boston where everything's kind of compact and goes up. Los Angeles is all spread out. I mean, it goes on for miles and miles and miles. It wasn't like that. Capernaum is a relatively small town. And it's pretty easy to find him. Plus, if you're looking for Jesus, if you're looking for the teacher, if you're looking for the rabbi, where do you go? You go to the synagogue, and that's where he was. And most of this interaction takes place at the synagogue. It's also interesting that they call Jesus rabbi or teacher. Now, that's respectful, and we would maybe expect that. But, again, let's just think about the context. They just seen him feed twenty thousand people with a couple of loaves and a couple of fish. Rabbi, that's the best you have. I mean, I I think it's kind of you know it's a little bit of an understatement there. But really, why did they care about when they they didn't much care about that? What would you want to know? If you'd caught up with Jesus, 
and you knew that there was no boat that could take you from one side to the other, what would you say? You wouldn't say, hey, when did you get here? You'd say, how did you get here? They don't ask that. So it's not really too surprising that Jesus kind of ignores their trivial question and goes on to other things. And you know, this is something I like to do too, if you're talking to an unbeliever. Ignore the trivia, go for the jugular. Listen to verse 26. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Now, if he had told them, look, I just walked across the Sea of Galilee, you guys should have seen that? That would have been really neat. You would have liked it. What would that do? I think it would just focus them on, even more so, on the miracles and on the power of Jesus and maybe even give them more of a desire to make him king. He doesn't do that. He cuts to the chase. It's not the miracles that they're after. It's not the signs that they're interested in. They're not spiritual in any sense. Their thinking is completely earthly. Again, look at what they're after. It's the free food. Look at that. Right there at the end of 26, he says, you're not seeking me for the signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Oh, they were seekers. They were seeking after Jesus. But they were the worst kind of seekers. They weren't even intrigued like Nicodemus was when he came to Jesus at night, the teacher of all Israel, and he said, you know what, see some of these signs that you're doing, and we know that no one can do those signs except for he sent from God. There was none of that. There was absolutely no interest in things of a spiritual nature. They were not interested in trying to figure out what Jesus' bigger mission was all about. They were not motivated by anything noble. They are motivated by sheer laziness. Think about life at that time. It wasn't easy. You worked to live and you lived to work. There were no grocery stores. There were no fast food restaurants. There was no frozen food. I don't know how bachelors survived. It's just no microwaves? Come on! Life itself is not possible. So Jesus challenges the crowd. He's saying, you have no interest in spiritual things, but only in filling your stomachs without working. Without working, you're lazy. This verb that he uses, ate, it's unusual because it, it is usually applied to cattle eating grass. So by inference, he's kind of like, you know, you guys are like cattle, you're like cows. All you want to do is just eat the, the grass of the, you know, that's laying right out in front of you. You don't want to do anything to provide for yourself. Universal truth is their desire was to be saved from work. Universal truth number two, there is a desire to be saved by work. A desire to be saved by work. I alluded, that, uh, alluded to that in my intro. Look at verse 27. The Lord says, Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Now this verse is just packed. But this conversation is kind of dissonant. It, 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 it's, it's like two colliding notes. You've heard the phrase, you know, that uh, women are from Venus and men are from Mars, you know, and what's that meant to illustrate? It's meant to illustrate how different their thinking is and how they have difficulties in communicating. Well, here we have a much bigger gap. It's much bigger because Jesus' mind is set on heavenly things and their focus, the crowd's focus is on earthly things. Talk about the difference between Venus and Mars. How about the difference between heaven and earth? Our Lord engages here in, as we saw many weeks ago, with the uh, woman at the well, a shawl, a veiled saying, something that's not entirely clear when he says it. If you recall with the Samaritan woman, he talked about living water and never thirsting again. And she was... She was confused. Here she is in the middle of the desert. She takes it literally, and she's just like, you know, that would be great. I'd love to not have to go get any more, more water. That would be wonderful. 
She didn't really understand what he was saying. She didn't understand who he was until he started talking about things that he couldn't possibly know. Revealing things about her past that only God could know. When he did that, she understood that he wasn't just some man wandering through the wilderness talking in riddles or enigmatic statements, but that he was more than what he appeared. So let's break this down. The same thing's going on here. He's talking in enigmatic statements that they're misunderstanding and they're going to believe it. Verse 27, let's look at just the beginning of that again. Do not work for the food that perishes. Think about all the effort that they were exerting just to get a free lunch, free food. Look for him, search for him, cross the sea, look for him again, find him, start quizzing him. And what he's saying here is, listen, after that food is gone, after this meal is over, then what? What are you going to do? This food is going to perish. It's got an expiration date. It's stuff that's in the refrigerator. It's going to go south. It's going to spoil. This reminds me so much of Matthew chapter 6, verse 30 and 33. I'll just read it. But if God so clothes the, gla the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things. And your Heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Keep your mind focused on heavenly things, not on earthly things. Be focused on eternal things, not temporal things. Again, in verse 27. But for the food that endures to eternal life. Now, there's a strong contrast. We understand that but contrast things, but there are a couple different Greek words. This is the one that gives us, like, the strongest possible contrast. And in this context, it indicates that these things are, are nearly polar opposites. They can't be more different if, you, if they could possibly be more different than we couldn't express it. They're 180 degrees apart. The food they were obsessed with would temporarily relieve their physical need. What Jesus was offering would permanently relieve their spiritual need, their ultimate need. This is something we probably fly by here in verse 27 going on just a little bit. But for the food that endures to eternal life, now listen to this, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him God the Father has set his seal. This is a claim of exclusivity. Why do I say that? Well, Jesus here refers to himself as the one, the only one who can give eternal life. And he justifies that statement by saying that the Father put his seal on him. Now he says, which the Son of Man will give to you, that's him. There's no one else that can give you this food that will endure to eternal life. There is no other way to get it. If you guys are worrying about feeding your stomach, you ought to be worried about getting something far more valuable from me. And the seal was symbolic of authentication. We understand that. If I send you an email and I encrypt it, for those of you who are familiar with such things, I can give you the key so you can decode it and read it. But that also lets you know that nobody's tampered with it and it's genuine. Well, in the ancient world, they didn't have email. I don't know how they got by, but they didn't have email. But the way that you would know that a letter or some kind of order or almost anything was authentic was the ruler, the person of import who was sending this thing to you would put a bit of wax on it and they would put their signet ring on there and it would carry the seal of authenticity. Jesus is saying, I have the signet ring, the seal of God the Father on me. I am authentic. I'm the authentic messenger. I'm the only one who can do this. I've been sent by God to do this. So what was the seal? What was the mark of authentication? We didn't have a piece of wax, you know what I'm Many possible explanations here. The sign miracles, right? I mean, that's what drew Nicodemus. 
He said, we know that no one can do these things unless he's sent of God. He understood that Jesus had that seal on him. We would also be able to appeal to the words of John the Baptist. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But the testimony of Jesus he said over and over again where he was. How about the audible approval of the Father when Jesus gets baptized? Any of those things, and we could probably come up with more. Marks of authentication from God. Who else has the Father set a seal upon? Who else is certified, authorized to grant eternal life? No one. No one. Now the crowd, talk about a mashal, talk about a veiled saying, talk about Venus, Mars, Earth, Heaven, however you want to look at it. Look at what they do in verse 28, how they just completely miss this. Instead of, well, tell us how we get this bread from you. Listen to what they say, verse 28. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Give us a list, Jesus. Tell us how we can do this. They understand he's pushing them to think about the eternal, the spiritual, sacred things. But their conclusion is that Rabbi Jesus should just give them a laundry list, a punch list, checklist, things that they need to do to get to heaven. They might as well just say, we will do the works of God. We will obey the law of God. We will solo bootstraps and we will earn our way into heaven. During this discourse, later on in the chapter, Jesus himself will obliterate such thinking. Do you think you can do this on your own? Do you think you can obey? Do you think you can do anything on your own? Listen to John 6.44. No one can come to me, Jesus says, unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. No one has the capacity, the ability, or even the desire to obey or honor God, apart from the grace of God going first, without his causing us to be born again. Remember what he said to Nicodemus? You must be obedient in all these aspects of life. No. You must be baptized. No. He said you must be born again. You must be born again. <laughs> Apart from that, you have no desire and no capacity to obey God. The brazenness of declaring to the Lord that if he would just tell them what to do, they would perform it. That's what they're saying. But the truth is, no, they wouldn't. And none of us would. This at its core is idolatrous thinking and is born into the heart of every single person. When you come into this world, whether it's Jude, probably the youngest person, you know, at BBC these days, whomever, we're born with hearts that worship ourselves. We don't worship God. We believe that we will ascend to the Most High. We will, by our own devices, by our own effort, by our own works, make ourselves fit for heaven. Jesus utterly refutes that. And he does that by proclaiming the work that saves. That's our third point this morning, the work that saves. Look at verse 29. Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. Now, it's important to note here that when the crowd asks Jesus their questions, what do they say? What do we do? How, how do we do the works, works of God? I'm underscoring that S. They want to know, you know, what, what, what things they have to do. But Jesus says there's a singular work. Why is that significant? Because there is no laundry list. It's not about five pillars or seven sacraments or being sealed in the temple or being numbered in the 144,000 or any other requirement that you can think of. 
What do you have to do? Jesus tells us, believe in him whom he, the Father, has sent, upon whom he has sent his, set his seal. The Lord Jesus Christ, believe in me, he's saying. It is his work that is eternal and abiding, sufficient to both merit heaven and grant forgiveness of sins. Any work you do before salvation to prepare yourself for salvation would only negate it, would only negate his work. Your best works are less than worthless. They're a negative. After salvation, well, that's an entirely different matter, but I'm not talking about sanctification this morning. I'm talking about salvation. How do we get into heaven? So you might say, well, surely I must believe. That's something I have to do. Well, yes, you do. But as one commentator wrote, it would be to misunderstand what the evangelist has said here if it were supposed that the act of faith were an act grounded in an independent, individual decision to believe. In other words, it's not because of your free will. Yes, you must believe. And this is not some empty phrase. You cannot be some nebulous person of faith. Faith always has an object. And listen to this. Faith always has an object. And the object of that faith is one of two things. It is either Jesus Christ or is the God of your own creation. And I would include Allah. I would include any other God or even yourself. If you have convinced yourself that you, in fact, are good enough, you've made yourself God. No one is good. No one will stand before God on Judgment Day and demand entrance into heaven based on their own good works, their own righteousness, their own attitude, their own intentions. Can I just be blunt? I want to be blunt for a moment. We live in a society that what? That says if a police officer dies in the line of duty, heaven. A firefighter dies in the line of duty, heaven. A soldier dies in service to his country, heaven. A teacher dies protecting her students from some madman in a school, heaven. People die in a terrorist attack, heaven. People die of some horrible disease, heaven. We live in a world that says it's not faith that matters. It's not Christ that matters. It's dying that matters. And if you die in some unfair way, if you die sacrificially, heaven, you've earned it. Folks, you can't earn it. And I take no joy. I mean, I, I grieve when I read of these stories. I have tried uh, I cried when I found out my friend Don died. Cancer just a few weeks after I saw him. I long with my entire being that every single one of these people in all these situations and more, I mean, any tragedy you can name, I want them to be in heaven. I don't want anybody to be in hell. But I'm not God. He sets the standard. He has revealed the truth to us in his word. And what happens if we just put it aside and we say, you know what, I, I know the truth claims of Christ. I know what he says here. I know he says that he's the only way that we can have this food that leads to eternal life. But what about this situation? And what about that situation? And this just doesn't seem fair. And that doesn't seem right. And when we do, when we engage in that kind of thinking, what we're ultimately doing, we wouldn't want to do this. We wouldn't actually do this, but the truth is what we're doing is saying, God, you're a liar. Your word is not truth. I don't believe what you've said. There has to be another way. There is no other way. We just can't set aside the word of God. We can't do that. You must believe Jesus is who he says he is. 
You must believe all that the Bible teaches about it. You must believe you cannot save yourself or even add anything to the perfect, finished, singular work of Jesus Christ. It's his entire body of work. It's his perfect life, his sacrificial death, all those things together. You must believe in all that. You must believe that Jesus is fully God, eternally God and fully man. You must believe that he was born of a virgin. You must believe that he alone of all men never sinned, not even one time. He perfectly kept the law that we cannot keep. He obeyed in every way. That perfect righteousness is credited to every believer, even though we didn't do it. That alone is the work of God that merits heaven. You must believe that he went to the cross in your place, taking the punishment that you deserve, satisfying the righteous wrath of God that you deserve, that you brought on yourself, that he paid the debt that you owe. You must believe that Jesus rose from the dead on the third day. Listen, saving faith has an object, an anchor. It's not willy-nilly faith. It's not fungible faith. It has an object, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. D.A. Carson put it this way. He said, Jesus is supremely the one who reveals God to us precisely because, unlike any other person, he has been in the courts of heaven and has been sent from there so that the world might be saved through him. This is the gospel. This is the good news. And any religion that adds requirements, works, whatever they want to call to it, transforms the good news of Jesus' victory over sin and death and hell into really horrible news. I remember years ago, we were having a yard sale, and these uh, two young female Mormon missionaries came up, and they were asking questions of me and a friend who was standing there, and they said, hey, well, we're just going around giving the good news. We said, well, what is your good news? And they told us, we said, that's horrible news. <laughs> you're, telling, you're telling people to be good. They can't be good. But this is what we do. This is, this is the human condition. We want to do it. If you're here this morning and you're thinking that you need to get right, I've heard this so many times. I know I need to get right with God. There's only one way, and it's not by cleaning yourself up. It's not by stopping whatever sin you're engaged in. It's to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't prepare yourself for salvation. You can't make yourself savable. You can't do anything like that. You are a sinner deserving the full wrath of God, yet in His love, in His mercy, He prepared a singular way, one way, for you to avoid what you deserve. He sent His Son to bear the wrath in your place. And this morning I beg you, I plead with you to believe. Trust in Christ alone. And you may be thinking, well, I'll, I'll consider these claims and at some future point, you know, maybe I'll act on them. As I've been reminded, I mean, my friend had, was given three to six months to live. He lived less than three weeks. We never know. Every breath, every heartbeat is a gift from God. We have no guarantee of tomorrow. What awaits those who reject or even delay believing on the Lord Jesus Christ? Eternity in hell. A place where the wrath of God never lessens or relents. Again, come to Christ. Be forgiven this very moment. Let's pray.